One of my favorite things to do here when visiting Savannah is to go to Factors Walk because I love things like the set of stairs. Reminds me of the Exorcist stairs. These are some mighty steep stairs for sure. And then she's way down there. There she goes. And believe it or not, these are not the steepest things that they have here. There are stairs that are even steeper, but they definitely make your legs wobble. But check this out, ready? Down here at the very end. Historic steps, use at your own risk. Hopefully that gives you a good idea of the scale of these steps. It's cool looking. We survived. Wherever I come, I've had luck. It's come my way. Wherever I go, hard luck. Is that it stays? Good luck never stays a day. A bad luck's always a coming my way. Don't get me wrong, Savannah is pretty amazing, but one of the most unique views in Savannah is what's called Factors Walk. And it's nestled right behind River Street. And it's right back here, tucked away from the rest of Savannah where you will find Graveface Museum, oddities, and records. Now here's the thing, when Jessica and I were here living in Savannah, we made friends with the owners of Graveface Records. When we moved, however, they opened up this museum. It's been a couple years, first time here for us, and we're taking you with us. Inside this wall, behind these doors, is horror memorabilia, true crime memorabilia, serial killers, cults, the weirdest oddities that you can imagine. This is gonna be awesome. Great Face Museum Oddities Museum, focusing on all things unusual, macabre, unique, and mysterious. Record shop and pinball located inside. Let's see, if I can pull this all the way back, you can tell that they have a little door. That's interesting. Why do they have a little door? For little people like me. I swear, if I don't get to use that little door, And for any of you folks who are planning to visit, Grayface Museum is 410 East Factors Walk. And because of the pandemic, they do have modified hours, museum hours modified by COVID, Friday through Sunday, 12 p.m. to 7 p.m. And you can also find them on Instagram. Hey, Jessica, I don't know what's going on with that wall over there, but it's kind of making me want to watch Beetlejuice. I wonder if it's a doorway to the afterlife. I got the hair, let's go. I say let's, let's do it. Let's do it. The sun has gone down and the doors to this spooky, miraculous museum known as Graveface Museum is officially open. Let's go inside and see what they have. I find it absolutely hilarious that basically in order to get into this museum you gotta walk through the mouth of Satan. It all began with a curse. A curse from the grave. The evil you did this day 
will be avenged. So I'm Ryan Grayface. Uh, this is the only room I like to give any context in. Uh, everything else is pretty self-explanatory. This is what I call Roadside America. And you know this quite well. If you're driving across the country, 40s, 50s, 60s, and you popped off to any tourist trap. I don't call them that. That's what mean people call them. This is the sort of stuff that used to be inside those roadside attractions. So you have three aspects, like Clementine the five-legged cow here. You got a two-headed calf in that corner, two-headed pig. This was a performing circus bear. That was his little trick there. And you have spider fawn, two heads and six legs. So I point these things out as they were real living, breathing creatures, all right? The flip side of this room, sideshow gaff pieces. Fiji Mermaid, of course, is the most famous sideshow gaff of all time. Real monkey, real fish. Chop them both in half and pretend that it's a real thing. But my favorite version of that is this here Homer Tate fish girl piece. Homer Tate was the greatest gaff maker of all time. Uh, for this fish girl piece, he cut off his wife's hair and used his cat's teeth. Um, he made all these fucked up little mummies around the room. And they were mostly meant for the circus sideshow. Uh, at least that was his intention. This is straight from World Wonders, the Ward Hall show from Gibsonton, Florida. He used to, he used to be in there. Uh, that's a gaff shrunken head. Real human hair, fake face. The flip side of that are these. I'm not going to go into more detail on that. Because there's some controversial stuff about these. So we'll ask that. But all these little guys around here, the Crocodile Boy being my, probably my personal favorite. It's the only known Homer Tate piece in its original coffin. Like fully formed coffin. Mostly the coffin lids are what were preserved. So this is Crocodile Boy. Uh, the third and final aspect of this room, and then you guys can roam free, is the hoodoo voodoo stuff. So this kind of sounds weird, but all this cladding you see on the walls, I ripped out of this house. This was Madame Truth's house out towards the Isle of Hope, it's 15 minutes outside of Savannah. Before they bulldozed the house, I got the wood and rescued these other objects. So if you want some true Savannah history, someone that should be as famous as Marie Laveau is, read this, get into her. Uh, her legacy is pretty incredible. Last but not least, we opened for the first time on Valentine's Day. And a couple days before we opened, I started hyper-focusing on the fact that there's some light bleed through behind this wall and darkness behind here. So I cut a hole here to see why that is. I ended up pulling out this chanting speaking in tongues record from inside of the wall, as well as the various objects you see back there. So it should be noted that stuff is all voodoo, which is not native to Savannah, Georgia. Um, and a very recent update is last week we listened to the chanting record for the first time. And immediately afterwards, my wife conducted a seance. But what we learned, well, it was mostly gibberish, but the middle of side A, we do learn that the preacher or pastor or whatever he calls himself, is from Louisiana. And as a collector, that's really great because it's nice to have provenance for things. So uh, it does tie the stuff in the wall to Louisiana, which is pretty awesome. Room one and a half is the very, very local UFO room. Uh, so there's a pretty insane story about James Allen here that I won't get into, uh, other than the fact that he was killed by the FBI for knowing too much. So I'll leave it at that. You can easily Google and find out what I mean, but it's a Savannah uh, murder UFO story. Um, this is of particular interest to me as it happened to me. This is Nambia. Uh, Nambia was a customer at the record store in Starland. And he, I mean, I had met Nambia 50 times prior to this incident. Um, he used to come, I thought he was schizophrenic or something. He would come in and tell me about his, his alien life and what planet he's from and what, what life is like on said planet and how they get around and transport. I mean, like very detailed stuff. And I, I hate to say it, but I ignored it. And then one day he came in and he, he typically had some sort of walking cane, but he didn't have any sort of limp. So he had this cane and he asked if I wanted him to, to prove that he's an alien. So I said, yeah, sure, of course. So he whips this cane out 
and out of the bottom of the cane comes this laser beam that if you're a child drawing lightning out of a cloud and it looks you know like that like spiky that's what i saw come out of the bottom of this cane and it traveled probably five feet and he had complete control of it because he stopped it right at my chest i could kind of feel the heat from it and but i mean it was clear as day uh and then he just kind of left again and so it dawned on me that the guy's probably fucking an alien, right? <laughs> like, there's no doubt in my mind that he, he at least possessed some technology that I've never seen before because it wasn't overly hot, but yet it was completely controlled. Uh, so, he comes back one or two more times, and I have some dialogue with him. Now where I'm believing him, he actually gave me his phone number. And what he said is that he is here to document how we live um, and so he actually was posing as a homeless guy at the time a very interesting story fast forward two years and i'm on tour with i think the casket girls and this guy mike was working the shop for me and nambia drops this off so this was 2015 and nambia states that the figures that you see in this piece of artwork are actually how the thousands of other aliens from his planet see each other on this earth. So there's thousands and thousands of them, right? From his planet here, they don't see each other as humans. This is how they see each other. And, uh, you know, I regret, truthfully, I regret not spending more time picking his brain and he was, he was fascinating. And I recently, when I was writing this all up for the museum, I actually called the, the number because I hadn't tried it in like five years. And of course it's disconnected. But I looked at the area code just to see where it was, you know, where the phone was attached to originally. And it was some small island that I've never heard of. Um, I guess kind of out by Haiti or something. Like, like a place I literally didn't know existed their area code, which just added that much more, like, who the fuck is this guy, and where did he come? I mean, he was the most believable potential alien I've ever met, so. Yeah, that's a very, very local room. Like, these are all uh, local UFO sightings and things of that nature, so. Fun stuff. All right, so this is the cult slash occult room. Uh, obviously, some Heaven's Gate stuff. Everyone knows them. The Manson family, everybody knows Chuck Munson, as I call him. Uh, got some sweet pants, some Manson pants. That's the original Spawn Ranch sign. I got that from the lawyer that did a bunch of pro bono work for the family. Uh, he's the reason why many of them didn't do jail time, actually. And then a bunch of Manson drawings. Uh, on this wall, we've got a bunch of Jonestown stuff. Uh, one of the coolest things I own are a pair of his glasses. I was wondering, I thought that's what those were. And so it's actually a really dark story. Uh, I mean, you know, people's temple, hello, clearly dark. But specifically, how I got these, there's a guy named Tony that has been coming into my record store for ever. I don't know if he's a customer. I don't know if, I don't know if I've ever gotten money from Tony. But he came in and saw that I had little um, Jonestown pins. He was like, oh, you know, my aunt was in the People's Temple. I'm like, uh, no, I don't really know you. So no, I did not know your aunt was in the People's Temple. That's fucking fascinating. Like, did she die? Oh, no, 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 she escaped. I was like, what? What do you, like, ran into the jungle? No, 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 no. I'll, I'll be back. So he goes to his house, which is like a block away, and brings these and proceeds to tell me the story. So his aunt was in the California version of the temple before they moved, and apparently her close friend was raped by Jim Jones. And the way it all went down is he went up to her and handed his glasses to her, and that is how he let people know that he was going to have them. Now this applied to both men and women. So you either give yourself to him or he will take you. And his aunt, Tony's aunt, one day got the glasses. So she got 
the fuck out of the people's temple. Now, I found this story to be insane because I had never, I had heard about him swinging both ways and all that, but I, I didn't know the aggression. I didn't know it went in that that way, right? Um, but not everything is public knowledge, so I thought it was plausible. So he said, "I'll be back. I'll bring something else." So he goes home and brings back this letter from Jim Jones, a personal letter, which I to this day have never seen another Jim Jones letter. And in this letter, Jim is begging his aunt to rejoin because they're about to make this big move. Uh, but she never responded. She moved on with her life and she lived much happier not being in the people's temple. Uh, so that's, you know, many years later how I got those glasses. But uh, I have since, you know, since opening this museum, have talked to some people that have like either distant relatives, like basically that knew that he had a tendency to do that. So I guess that's that's not common knowledge, but I guess that's knowledge. Uh, maybe podcasts. I don't know how people learn stuff anymore, but uh, but very interesting nonetheless. And yeah, that's uh, Jim Jones glasses. This is crazy. Jonestown aftermath, November nineteenth, nineteen seventy-eight. Nine hundred eighteen people. It's crazy. There's even four packets of Kool Aid here, flea Verraid, that were recovered from Jonestown after the murder suicides. And speaking of Jim Jones, Jessica's over here listening to tracks 1 through 12 from the People's Temple Choir. It says track 13, mass suicide audio. Listen at your own risk. So I only listened to a couple minutes of it and it sounds like it's a live recording of him preaching to whom, I'm not sure, but basically saying let them come, we got weapons, we got everything we need, one life is not above all lives, you want to take one life, you're going to take all lives. And that was before the mass suicides. So this is a little occult wing here. Uh, this guy is a local Joseph Conklin who was a Walmart greeter. The Walmart on 17 across from Keller's Flea Market to be specific. Uh, I, he's interesting to me in that it's kind of a, a lack of su success story if you will. He obviously was adorable in, in high school but post high school really took a liking to uh, S&M and the occult. So he wrote a book called Necronomicon Revelations that is his, basically like his interpretation of the more confusing passages of the Necronomicon. Uh, and this is a first edition Necronomicon, which are insanely rare and stupid expensive. And I only point that out because he lived in absolute squalor and he had not just the first edition, but he also had the third edition, obviously to do research for his own book, but uh, it's just fun when you think of people's priorities. Uh, but I also have his identity as the S&M guy, and uh, I don't display those because it's really fucking disgusting, and I feel like he should be in jail, but I guess it's legal. I don't know. You can't you can't see that sort of thing on a little card, but some of the photos are very vile. Uh, we'll say that. But anyways, he is missing. To this day. To this day. Uh, so I got his estate maybe, it's been probably three or four years now. But uh, the quote on here, which is from his cousin who I got this stuff from, uh, it wouldn't be unlike Joe to open a gate to hell and accidentally fall in. And I just think that's a funny... That's Mr. Conklin. So yeah, another local, each room has a, a local weirdo in it, at least one. Because Savannah, you know, is known for its ghost bullshit. Uh, and in most of it is exactly that. They're like stories that are not based in any sort of reality, people that never existed and this sort of thing. Uh, so this is me doing my part to kind of 
elevate the real weirdos, even if they're shitty people that do exist in this town. So. All right, so this is a weird, like, death, uh, odd fellow sort of room. I have a very massive odd fellows collection and have forever. Um, you know, engraved odd fellow skull over here and just a bunch of fun odd fellow stuff. But probably the most personal thing, or maybe the second most personal thing in this museum is this. So this is my great grandfather who donated his body to the Oddfellows Lodge uh, of Ohio. And when the lodge closed, uh, not too long ago, I mean, this is probably five years ago or something, uh, they got in touch with my family and said, what would you like us to do with this body? And so, you know, the obvious answer was to bury it in the Oddfellow Cemetery. I vetoed this idea, and now it's here. So, family. He's the bottom left in that photo there. Um, but yeah, it just... Uh, That's cool. Well, it's cool because he donated his body to the lot, right? Right. So, like, he did not want to be buried, so I, I just thought it was a, a no-brainer to bring him here. Oh! That's good. Yeah. That's good. You like that pun? I did. All right, so this is the newest wing of the museum. I call it video violence. Uh, it's a very self-serving part of the museum. And actually, comically, since we opened it like three weeks ago, this has been the only, <laughs> of all of the fucked up things I own, this is the one that people seem like kind of annoyed by or something. But basically, I'm obsessed with VHS and the, the format is everything to me and going to video rental stores in the late 80s, early 90s, is exactly how I ended up the way I am. Uh, and, and my obsession with very, very deep cult horror cinema, uh, not surface level at all, to a point of extreme nerdism. Anyways, so this is self-serving in the sense that it's, you know, like deep horror one sheets and beta and VHS, but also the stuff that I put out on my television label that celebrates it. Uh, so it's a lot of super rare tapes, even like the one popular movie, Nightmare on Elm Street, it's the media stuff, which is hard as hell to come by. Uh, and then you kind of wrap around here, really rare stuff, rare stuff. But this is, there is no more inspirational a guy than Herschel Gordon Lewis to me. Uh, and this is his, his little wing in the museum. I was lucky enough to know the guy, and it breaks my heart every day that he's dead. But he is the godfather of gore. Blood wouldn't exist in film without this fucked up individual. Uh, he scored most of his films, like John Carpenter, but he has no sort of cachet. Uh, most people think his movies were horseshit. I think they could not have been better. So this is a nod to him. And then all of this is shot on video stuff, which is the other most inspirational thing for me, meaning you picked up a fucking VHS camcorder and you made a movie. And the quantity of those in the 80s was, I mean, lots of, lots of movies, right? And the fact, growing up, that, that's why I make movies. I don't show most of them. Uh, they're for me and for me only. But it's because of stuff like these, like completely ridiculous films. Video violence being my favorite, um, hence me naming this whole exhibit the video violence exhibit. But yeah, it's a very, very nerdy part of the museum that does not seem to be translating to most people. There's also a little tie-in to true crime here, uh, where the, the father of the Menendez brothers uh, actually worked for this imprint. Uh, I don't think a lot of VHS people know that, and it's just kind of interesting because, you know, they fucking killed their mom and dad, and uh, and that's what this here trading card is, is them, after, you know, killing their parents and taking their money, they got courtside seats for the Knicks. And then they ended up on a fucking trading card after murdering their parents. So, yeah, it's just, it's fun to tie something like that into VHS. Because <laughs> it really ties all my interests together. 
All right, so the midway point, the palette cleanser, as I like to call it, of the museum is the Creature Castle Pinball Pit. And so it's all horror-themed pinball machines. There's, I don't know, 16? I don't know how many there are. I keep buying them, so it's hard to, hard to remember. But I would say, as far as a public place, it's probably the largest collection of horror-themed pinball machines that I know of, outside of people that have every game in general. Um, so this is all set to free play. And it's really meant to, like I said, it's the midway point of the museum. So you have fun for a moment or three hours, and then you head upstairs to finish off and get reacquainted with death. So this is the circus sideshow. This is the clown nook, but oh, there's circus sideshow. Uh, my favorite thing, well, the stupidest thing that I have ever bought in my entire life, I'm going to show you right now. All right, so you see this clown throwing this spiky looking ball to that bastard kid. Yeah. So that's the clown's hat. That's the clown's nose. And that's his dead fucking body in the box. Clown in a box, get it? <laughs> that's awesome. It's pretty stupid. <laughs> that's I don't think it's stupid. I think it's absolutely phenomenal, especially whenever you can, you know, put a story and a picture to it. Yeah. That's quite easily one of the coolest things in, in my opinion you have. <laughs> hey, I love dead clowns. That's all I know. And yeah, the, I think for him, he's probably thrilled because he's right across the aisle from 4Titty. So <laughs> 4Titty looks at Clown in a Box. So yeah, this is all sideshow stuff. Um, it's, uh, there's another relative on the wall. Not another relative's corpse, but this is a uh, you don't want to hear it. It gets into my family. More fam- you don't need more of my family. So this is the true crime room, obviously. Um, uh, well, maybe not obviously, but if you pan real quick, it's pretty fucking clear as day. So for some insane reason, and I don't know why, I have by far the world's largest Gacy collection. Uh, John Wayne Gacy collection. And this is probably one sixteenth of the total collection. I mean, I've got uh, almost about half of everything that remains to this day, um, plus like a thousand letters and 14 hours of audio that no one's ever heard and um, the very last check that he wrote the day he was arrested, uh, you know, the trial used crime scene photos and kind of one of the most significant pieces I own is this soulful piece. This is the only known Gacy to have been painted before Death Row. Everything else you've ever seen is something he painted or drew on Death Row. This soulful piece is the only, literally on Earth, on planet Earth, this is it. Uh, it's a very special piece, and I got that from the guy that photographed these uh, trial used photos, uh, which is, you know, from underneath his house. Yeah, it's a, it's a massive, massive, massive collection, and I'm lucky enough uh, in like four or five days to be driving to Arkansas to pick up more from his sister. You're getting more? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean it with respect. No, no I'm no, jealous. I, yeah, it's, it's unnecessary. It's needlessly large, but, you know, she's got childhood photos of his that no one's ever seen. She's got... Uh, the very first Christ painting he did was actually for his mom as a gift for Christmas. Uh, and there's a really depressing thing that he wrote on the back, so I'll be getting that. Um, the, probably the most important thing historically of Gacy's, and, and I'll be getting it from her in a couple days, is the, the ledger. So he kept meticulous records. Okay, if, uh, if he called... G.G. Allen, right? He would make a note called G.G. Allen at 4.54 p.m. Spoke for 10 minutes. Uh, talked about so-and-so. Not not quite like a diary, more like, like a ledger. Right. Uh, like just plowing through facts of his day. Uh, and Karen, his sister, said they were mostly very, very boring to her. Uh, and after, there were s seven of them. 
uh, he started in 82, he started keeping this ledger in 82 and it went obviously till his execution in 94. She, the day he was executed, burned six of the seven of them. And I, I get it. Like, I can't, right, right. I can't imagine how, how fucking hard, how hard her life has been. Um, and she's such a good person and I, I really like her quite a bit actually. Anyways, she kept one ledger, and it was the one that he kept for about two years uh, before his execution. So, originally that kind of bummed me out, because I wanted, I actually wanted the opposite. I wanted the 82 to 84 the most, because it's the period that people know the least about. It's before he was famous and this sort of thing. Um, but now that I'm giving it more thought, the 92 to 94 would be fascinating, because it would be when he's famous and you know celebrities are buying his you know johnny depp like does he buy directly from gacy i'll find out does right. he use an you know you know one of the art dealers because uh, gacy had several art dealers I, i'm just curious how I, i'm that much into this that i want the i want the logistics i want to know how it all went down i want to know the kind of money that he made i mean i have i have a fucking idea because i know how much he charged for these things and I, I, like I said, he had art dealers, so at some point they were getting a cut of the profits, but still, it's all very interesting to me. Um, but the most interesting period for me is the early stuff. Like this Indian summer piece is the second known piece to exist. Uh, it's literally number two. So when he started serial numbering in 1982, this is number two. And this is the first ever hi-ho number four total, also in 1982. The early stuff to me is where it's at, because he's not, he, no one has any interest. So he's, he probably spent like a week on this, right? Whereas when you look at the stuff that he did uh, right before he was executed, it's templated, he probably did 200 of these Manson paintings, right? Like he's just plowing through, changing the backgrounds, altering the nose, like slight things, but they're cool because of, they're, they're cool because they're Gacy's, but they're also less personal and certainly not representative of anything. Uh, but the the early stuff, I just really like, you know. And that kind of he kind of phased that out in in '88. Um, like from '82 to '88, he did 561 pieces, and then from late '88 to his execution, he ended up doing an additional 2,000 pieces. So he did all over 2,600 pieces in the course of his life. Uh, and if you think about that, that's because he mostly moved to a templated system. Just to, like I said, just to plow shit out. So uh, yeah, it's a very specifically nerdy thing to be into. Um, I think it's awesome. So, I mean, it, it, it is what it is. I mean, it's, it's death related. But um, respectfully, it's awesome. It's intriguing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it's something that's very unique. Yeah. And like I said, it's you know there are other people that have decently large Gacy collections, but uh, to to my knowledge, I mean I've never met anyone that has low number Gacy stuff. Uh, I would love to meet them if you're out there. Uh, get in touch. I don't even. I mean I don't even. I don't even need to buy your shit because I've got plenty. It's more I want to. I want to see what is number one and number, you know, like the missing numbers. I want to know what one and three is, or like, I just want to know what those pieces were. So I actually started, I mean, to get really nerdy, I started a, a public XLS document uh, that lists every single known piece, even stuff that was destroyed in all the fires. Uh, victims' families were buying up the paintings and burning them. So I surmise there's about... 450 Gacy's that still exist um, unless someone's got a fucking trove of them which I don't think they do and just then throw it out there I don't know if you'd know maybe you do know how many do you have uh a lot a lot we'll keep it at that yeah, yeah. I mean there's a lot in this room so that's I have again I have way too many uh, nobody needs this quantity of Gacy's and I, I can't sell them. I sell records for a living. I don't sell this shit. That's why I opened a museum. I hoard this stuff, hence the museum. Uh, I have no interest. Uh, I would potentially trade doubles or something like that because I have several different variants of the Manson painting. You know, I would if someone had something to offer, I would trade. But or if someone gave me fuck you money, I love fuck you money. 
but no one ever, no one ever offers me fucking money. So I just like it conceptually. Uh, so yeah, that's part of this room. Uh, kind of like a, an add-on to that piece is over here. This is John Pecoraro's artwork. And JP is a, a relative unknown. Uh, he was Gacy's cell neighbor and bodyguard. Uh, he was not executed because Illinois changed their death penalty laws. So he just, as he puts in his paintings, he's just rotting in hell. Um, so these, the top three, are paintings that he painted for uh, this guy Charles Crehor. That's who I acquired them from. And these were painted during Gacy's life. And then these two he painted for me last year. And this is the Christmas card he sent me in December, where if you open it, it says, Merry Bloody Christmas, Love, JP. Uh, you know, I... He calls me almost every day. Like, we talk... Wait, I mean, and this has been going on for years. Uh, very nice guy. He's, you know, they're all monsters, right? But uh, he treats me fine. Um, but I, my larger thing with all this Gacy stuff is I'm working on an audio documentary. And so he's been very integral of getting me introduced to people that Gacy were friends with. Um, he has insane Gacy stories, so I've recorded him telling those stories to me. So he's, you know, it's kind of why I keep him around. <laughs> if you, I mean, I like, I like him. I, I hate to say that I like someone that's a fucking serial killer, but he's, he's done nothing to me. He claims he's innocent. I'm sure he's not innocent. Uh, but yeah, that's why I don't communicate with serial killers ever because they're all pieces of crap but him i kind of need to because he's that last living link to get right. his day to day so there's a it's a weird like what he's getting from me is that that semi i guess uh, companionship if you will or whatever and what i'm getting off of him are these stories and obviously paintings from time to time so um he just as a, a sidebar he had a canvas this size, what is it, 18 by 24, that um, he said, this was maybe back in July, I've got this blank 18 by 24 that I've been holding for like 10 years. It's yours. What do you want on it? And I was like, you know what would be cool? Something Pennywise, because Pennywise, the character was, that's uh, you know, based off of Gacy, and that's kind of what got me into Gacy when I was a little kid. So it's like this full circle thing. I just thought it would be interesting. So, I, he, what he ended up deciding, I haven't seen the piece of artwork yet, uh, so I, and I cannot wait. I'll give you the explanation as he told me. So, it's going to be the many faces of Pennywise, and he's like, you know the scene where Pennywise comes out of the chick's pussy? And I, I that's exactly how he said that word, and I like, wanted to vomit and laugh at the same time. He's like, that's in the top left. <laughs> so... I, did I correct him? No, because I, I don't recall that scene in the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can't wait to see his disgusting interpretation of that. So and that's him on the wall. Yeah. And this is the newest exhibit in the True Crime Room. It's all Ed Gein stuff. Uh, a lot of people say Gein. Say 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 whatever you want to say. He is. Him and Gacy to me are the most influential in the world of horror cinema. Uh, obviously, I, I mean, you could say Gein more so than Gacy, right? With Psycho and Silence of the Lambs and, uh, I mean, fucking Deranged. Clearly Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Leatherfaced, and so on. So, without his disgusting crimes, there would be no horror cinema like I like it. Because uh, they're literally taken from, <laughs> from his case. And then like I just said, Gacy with Pennywise. So, um, you know, these two guys together kind of make up the, the bulk of everything. So, I, I am such a horror fanatic that that, I think, is the... I'm not innately a large true, con, true crime guy. I don't... I don't... I didn't set out to, like, have a large true... I don't want this to be a true crime museum, per se, uh, or, you know, singularly. And I have no interest in having, like, the world's largest true crime collection. But these specific people that influenced horror cinema, that's, that's where it's at for me. Right. I get it. Um, and so this is the collection of Alan Wilimowski. 
uh, well, and in part, his brother Joseph. Um, so Wilimowski is who got Gein to confess uh, after, I think it was like 14 hours of constant badgering him. Um, yeah, it's, it's an insane collection because no one has Gein stuff. Like, some guy named Douchebaggins that has a museum in Vegas claims he has a cauldron owned by Gein, but I was at that auction. The auctioneer specifically stated that it could have been owned by Gein, which is a little bit different. It was from Plainfield around the same time. So, to my knowledge, and I could be wrong, this is by far the largest amount of Gein shit that exists. And it's all from Willemowski. I mean, the very first time that Willemowski talked to Gein, this is Willemowski just writing out, like, thoughts, you know? This is how Gein is acting at this point in time. Um, you know, and the, there's all court documents and really interesting stuff, but the, the pinnacle of true crime collecting is this. I mean, there's, there is nowhere else to go from here. Um, so that's Ed Gein's handwriting on the key fob. That's what the back of the key fob looks like. It's a Plainfield shell service station. And then I, I am not the sort of person that says things definitively because life isn't definitive, right? I believe this to be his mother's hair. And it makes perfect sense that it would be, given the obsession, given the time, you know, when she, she would have been around in the Victorian era where they would keep locks of hair as a memento, this sort of thing. And it doesn't, I can't imagine him having some stranger's hair on his person as he's going about his daily life. Right. Um, so I'm not going to definitively state that it's hers, but I, I can't imagine it would be anyone else. Um, I don't think there's anything like this on earth. Like this is most of everything was destroyed. His house burnt really quickly. The evidence was destroyed. There's just not much left. So there's a, a couple items that Willemowski grabbed from the house. Um, I mean, this is an insane picture that he took of a bunch of human bones. This is him standing on a chair taking a picture of all of these bones laying out. And, and in that little baggie, I suspect, are some of those bones, as they're random bones that were in his collection. Uh, so yeah, and, and like the, even the crime scene photos, which if you've bought any books on Gein, uh, not these exact angles, but obviously the crime scene photos do make an appearance. I've never seen them this crystal clear because these are coming from his camera. So, I mean, these are the clearest, clearest things I've seen. So, it's a insane, it gives me the creeps, but I, I also just can't believe I own it sort of thing. It's, uh, I would call this the closest thing I own to uh, something that's newsworthy. Just because if you go through all of the documents like I did for many, many, many hours, several days, you start to learn stuff that is not public knowledge about the Ed Gein case and the trial and all this. And it's, I don't know why, even, like I said, reading Deviant or any of the books written about him, that information isn't there. And I don't know why, but it's now kind of my goal to make it known. So... It's not biased, like, um, it's not Willemowski's concepts of Gein. It's from Gein's mouth, which is what makes it, like, so, yeah, that's the, the long-term goal, and I, I, I wanted to do it before I open this exhibit, is to archive everything. Like, literally get an intern, every single word that's in all these thousands of pages of documents, get it down, and then I could refer to it later, but I just, like all things, I ran out of time, so... That's going to have to come at a later point. And, I mean, there's, there is a book in here. Um, definitely. I mean, it's an intense subject, and, and people don't know the half of it. So. I, uh, Ed Gein is probably one that I'm more familiar with. And, I mean, you know, Pogo the Clown, John Wayne Gacy. Uh, but, like you were saying, kind of gives you, like, the willies, the creeps. Yeah. That gives me the creeps. Yeah, I mean, there's... I mean, you just know, if you know anything about Ed Gein and his relationship with his mom yeah. and the story behind it, if, by chance, that's what it is, which would make sense, 
that's just that's a whole lot of messed up right there yeah i mean i i say the the alternative to that being his mom and i don't think it's this the only alternative is it's one of the corpses that he dug up mm -hmm. and that's fucked up too exactly <laughs> <laughs> but i i really think it's his mom and i will say <laughs> chloe when we were hanging this chloe figured it out um i was like what is this hard thing all the way at the top of the key fob and she is a taxidermist and she deals in death uh, pretty regularly. She's like, Ryan, that's, that's the skull. That's a chunk of human skull. Oh, I see it, yeah. And I was like, I don't think so, honey. And then I re-examined it and I was like, you're right, it's just an old fucking skull. Uh, so, sleep well, kitties. <laughs> so, in this room alone, because you already have so many Gacy paintings, is the very first painting you've ever acquired in this room right now? Boom! Boom. I, it's, it's magical. <laughs> yeah, so Skull so, Clown, which he made, he made several Skull Clowns. Um, but this was mine. This was Rai Rai's first Gacy. I was, uh, I think I was 15. I don't know. It's definitely the spookiest looking one that they have here, that you have here. Yeah, it's... So, there is a book called Killer Clown, and it's not very well written. Um, it's one of the detectives on the case, and it's, it's basically him, for the most part, like, trailing Gacy, and, you know, if, uh, if Gacy went to Waffle World on Harlem Avenue, they would pop in and literally just dine, like, right next to him, and... Just trail them. So it's very, you know, for the most part, it gets good, obviously, because the case develops. But um, what I did, I, I kind of used that book as a, um, <laughs> you know, like Rick Steves Europe or something, <laughs> like one of those travel books uh, that were popular in the 90s. And I just started going to all those locations when I was young. And I literally would go to addresses that are mentioned that are residential or private and just knock on the door and be like hey weird question i know i'm a kid but i was reading killer clown did you know gacy and most of it was fuck you slam doors this sort of thing but through that i got this that's uh, cool so that's just to give some background that's uh, behind you you have the, the the giant painting of i am pogo the clown for those who do not know the significance of him as a clown. Everybody knows. Um, <laughs> do, 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 you, do you want to tell it? I mean, he, so he had two registered clowning personalities, Pogo and Patches. Um, and Pogo's the most popular of the two. Yeah, I think just because the name is... Right. It's fun. It's, it's fun. Fun. Uh, I mean, fun. You guys are fucking lunatic. It ain't fun. Uh, yeah, my wife painted this on the wall because we thought it would be funny if parents put their kids right here and took it's pictures of It's like a photo spot. Family. And what's insane is that's exactly what's happened. Like little kids, little innocent kids are sitting here and their parents are like, pose in front of Pogo. And I'm like, oh my God, what have I created? Uh, anyways, that's not what you asked. Um, yeah, Pogo was the most popular of his clowning personalities. Um, I actually prefer Patches, which is this clown. I think it, I don't know, it vibes better with me for some reason. Uh, and if you want to see what he looked like as a man, as Patches, that's, that's, that is him as Patches right there. Uh, so that's Gacy as Patches. Yeah. You know, yeah. very scary dude. Right? <laughs>